The meeting title is Do, P Do British People Benefit from the Oppression of the Global South? And our speaker will be Manny Tano, who's a leading socialist and anti privatisation campaigner from Ghana. Uh, thank you, comrades. Um, sorry, I have a bit of a cough, or maybe I'm just choked with emotion from <laughs> <laughs> the, the joy of being here, or the outrage of what we're about to, part of aspects of what we're about to discuss. And of course, uh, I think that uh, when we talk in terms of capitalism today and, and some of the popular responses to it, one of the most outrageous, uh, the thing that outrages people the most is the, 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 the gaping inequalities that are forever escalating and becoming more and more entrenched across the world. And I think that um, this aspect of capitalism, I, I don't think is very new to socialists like us. We have always highlighted the fact that it is a system that is not simply exploitative, but it's also uneven, it is imbalanced, it's inequitable, and so on and so forth. But I think that um, one of the expressions of this trend, or this feature of capitalism, uh, seems to be the living standards of people in the global south, what was once called the third world or the developing world, and in the advanced, uh, highly industrialized, uh, advanced capitalist countries that form the core of the global system. And I think that uh, when we look at some of the statistics on the face of it, that, as I said, that gap continues to grow. So, say, in, uh, at, the, at the dawn of independence for most uh, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, the average gap between the average, the ratio of the average <clears throat> earnings of uh, 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 citizens in uh, this part of the world versus, say, Africa or Asia or Latin America, uh, African Asia for the most part, would have been about 30 to 1. By the time of uh, the mid 1990s, which is after the devastating impacts of the debt crisis, of two global recessions, of structural adjustments, uh, new liberal programs being uh, imposed on several of these uh, uh, global countries of the global south, that gap had increased to 62 to 1. And of course, this was in the mid-90s, just when a new phase of globalization and neoliberalism was being launched. So in 1995, for example, we saw that the World Trade Organization came into being and the whole uh, uh, you know, globalization of trade got a new intensity and with it finance and so on and so forth. By the end of that decade, that ratio was 74 to 1 and has been climbing since. We know, for example, that uh, in parts of the global south, if you take uh, Africa as an example, the minimum uh, agreed international minimum living income that anyone ought to have, which is $1.25 a day. We know that uh, in Africa, for example, the absolute numbers who live below that, that poverty line has increased. So that in uh, 1990, this period when the, 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 the income inequalities were becoming more and more wider, there were 280 million Africans who lived below uh, and less than $1.25 a day. Today, it is 450 million and climbing. Okay, and of course, even within that, about half of those people live on an average of 74 cents a day. And in South Asia and other parts of Latin America, the average is 98 cents a day. So we're really, really talking about, you know, some in, in intense immigration going on. But I think that it will be a mistake to think that this is the entire picture. It will be a mistake to say that this explains the, the, the reality of life across the globe and, and comparatively between the, 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 the North or the industrialized North and the global South. But I think that the first question that we ought to ask ourselves in beginning to understand that reality in a more comprehensive way is to say what has led to these developments, what has led to these, these trends that uh, that, uh, that, um, um, uh, that, that, that exists. And on top of that, we also know that um, um, the, 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 f the features of the industrialized world or the, the, the advanced capitalist countries themselves include intensifying inequalities. So it's eight white men who own wealth equal to or more than ha half the world's population. That's none of you, I suspect none of you are among that eight. And you know, and we could talk about the, some of the, the inequalities that exist here as well. But the first key to understanding what is happening and why the, the topic is relevant at all, because the topic implies a connection between living standards for workers in Britain and, and in the North and, of course, in the global South. And that makes sense because, of course, we are talking about capitalism as a global system. That's the most important feature of capitalism is the starting point of our understanding of what happens inside national economies in regional variations and so on and so forth. 
So for example, even in the most remote smallholder producer uh, uh, communities in some of these uh, global in the countries of the global south, where most people think that these are people excluded by capitalism, and that therefore the solution to development for those people has to be inclusive growth. For those people, I, I don't think that they are, they, are, they are detached from the rhythms of global capitalism at all. Take an ordinary farmer. Small scale farmer may be farming one acre or so. These days increasingly, whether it is the land itself, which is under threat of land grab, or competing with land for real estate or commercial property of different kinds, whether it is the seeds which are dominated increasingly by transnational companies, whether it is the fertilizers, whether it is the marketing of the crop, the branding, whether it's exports or for the domestic market, at every stage, you have to say that even if that uh, producer is not directly employed by a capitalist employee, his circumstances of his, the reproduction of his life cycle and his circumstances of existence are heavily weighed upon by global capitalism, and they are you know, severely circumscribed by, by, by global, global capitalism as well. So it's important for us to be able to say on the onset that we are talking about a global system, <clears throat> and, 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 and that is within that that not only does the topic make sense, but its relevance for us as socialism you know, it becomes even more pertinent. Because socialists are those who are committed not simply to exposing the inequities and imbalances and distortions of capitalism, or its unevenness and so on and so forth, we're also interested in saying that that system can and ought to be overthrown, and that system can be overthrown because it depends on the exploitation of labor across the world, and that that process of exploitation, that relationship of exploitation, gives those who are part of that process of exploitation the power to stop the, 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 the lifeblood, the, 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 the circuit of capitalism in its, in, 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 in its tracks, and therefore the power to organize to bring about a, a, a totally different uh, a, a kind of political and economic and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, so, social order. We are also particularly in, interested in this question because th those of us, not simply as socialists, but in this particular tra tradition of the international socialists, are those who have stood in the tradition of socialists who say that you cannot have socialism in one country or one region for that matter. Mm. In other words, we need a global solution and a global fight back, and that Local struggles, national level struggles, struggles in different parts of the world ought to be seen and are best seen if, as part of this continuum of, 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 of mutually reinforcing, uh, re re reinforcing struggle. Because we know the tragedies that happened, especially in the centenary uh, year that we have 19, uh, of 1917, we know the tragedies that happened with this path uh, that, that uh, you know, promoted the idea of, uh, of, 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 of socialism in, in one country. So I think, yes, it's important to, to, to start from, 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 those, from those, those, those bases. In any case, for us, the project of fight back for cap against capitalism, whether at the national level or, or, at, at, the, at, or, at, or at, the, at the global level, becomes impossible if we think that a whole section of the world working class, especially those in the centers, the metropolitan centers of capitalism itself, countries like Britain, have a vested interest in the exploitation of a, the, the majority of the world's population, if it is true or to the degree that it is true, if it is at all, that workers in Britain, or similarly in France or United States or Germany or wherever, have a vested interest and are direct benef beneficiaries of the exploitation and the oppression of people in the global south, then our project to fight capitalism, our project to bring about global solidarity, our project to fight racism consistently, and so on and so forth, those projects, I think, will be pipe dreams. They'll be utopian, there'll be, there'll be no serious basis for them, and they will not be sustainable. But we insist that they're sustainable, and the reasons why they're sustainable is to challenge one of the reasons, the, 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 the understanding that is important for us to affirm that the, 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 the viability of our project is to be able to challenge the proposition that is implied sorry, in the title of the meeting uh, about the uh, 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 British workers benefiting from, from, uh, from, 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 from the, the exploitation and oppression of, 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 global south, of the global south. And I think that one of the ways in which we, are, we can examine this is, by, is to look at the history of, of, of imperialism. Okay? We understand, for example, that uh, if you take Lenin writing about imperialism, um, 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 uh, um, uh, you know, or people like Tony Cliff and so on, they have discussed, the, the, this, this, they've touched upon and taken up this debate about the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the question of whether or not um, um, uh, you know, uh, Western workers benefit from the oppression and exploitation of workers in the global south, and the conclusions that they have drawn have been important in informing their, 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 their strategies and, and so on. Actually, that's the comrade who was supposed to be doing this meeting. Can I hand over to you now? Sorry. But that's one set of arguments. Another set of arguments, equally very powerful, 
say, say a different picture. And this is a, a quote from a book by Mike Davis, an American socialist, a book called Late Victoria, uh, Late Victoria Holocaust. He talks about the fate of tropical humanity at the precise moment, that's between 1870 and 1914, when its labor and products were being dynamically uh, uh, conscripted into a London-centered world economy. Millions died, he estimates 50 million, not, not because they were outside the modern world system, but in the very process of being incorporated into its political and, and economic structures. They died in the age of liberal capitalism, murdered by the theological application of the sacred principles of Smith, Bentham, and Mill, Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, and John Stuart Mill, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So if, it is a very powerful statement, and it is true that millions of people died in the process of this forcible incorporation into metropolitan uh, 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 capitalism. Of course, that process had been taking place long before the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, but its intensification in one respect in, in that period caused many things. It caused, the, for example, the, for, the enforcement of different modes of agricultural production, which did not fit with the climatic or environmental conditions, so crop failures, droughts, so on and so forth. This is what the, the experience of, of, of people, 50 million people dying in a, in a quarter of a century as a direct result of, of, of this, uh, this uh, extension of, of the global market and its, and its uh, integration of uh, huge sections of the global south, whether from Brazil, whether from Bermuda, whether from uh, Bolivia or, or you know, in, in Bengal, or, or in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Buganda in uh, uh, East Africa, this is part of the experience uh, that, 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 that actually Mike Davis documents uh, and, and, and describes. But it can lead to a conclusion. It can lead to a conclusion that in the age of imperialism, we're talking about a world, and in fact, Mike Davis says so, that this is the basis of having a world that is divided between the haves and the have-nots. And today we see a revival of that debate. A revival of that debate in the past couple of years, some important books have come out, important arguments by uh, uh, socialists, including one by a, a, a fellow called John Smith, uh, Imperialism in the 21st Century, I think that's what it's called. Another by uh, uh, one who describes the city of London and, and the role of finance in, uh, in, in, in British imperialism, and so on, uh, uh, Tony Norfield, and so on. And, and, and part of this argument is about the fact that, you know, I I imperialism is defined fundamentally by the exploitation of weak countries by stronger countries, or, and therefore the benefits accrue accordingly, or the benefits and losses accrue accordingly to the peoples or the populations of, 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 of those countries. Others have shown that this is, isn't, isn't quite the case. Uh, people like Michael Roberts, uh, Joseph Chunara, and so on and so forth have shown that this is, isn't quite the case. But it's an important debate in terms of actually uh, you know, uh, uh, um, how we engage with some of the questions that, I, uh, that, that, uh, that I've referred to. In any case, when we look at the experience that Mike Davis talks about, one of the ways in which we can describe it, one of the language, the, 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 the phrases that have historically been, been used to describe this pheno that phenomenon, that kind of phenomenon, is called the process of primitive ac accumulation. The process through which non-wage uh, uh, labor sections of the population are dispossessed of their land, that they are forcibly incorporated into the rhythm of the production of surplus value and profits and so on and so forth. It's a process which had already taken place in those same Western countries, like Britain, for example, or Ireland, for example. So that in the period that he's talking about is also the period immediately following the Great Famine in Ireland, for example. Okay, and the period that uh, of of uh, of the primitive accumulation in uh, 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 and, and the uh, enclosure of public lands in, uh, in uh, common lands in Britain the dragooning of uh, masses of the population uh, who had lost their land into the cities to work in the factories under conditions which, I mean, every day today we will call, you know, uh, 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 sweatshops and so on, the kinds of things that people like Dickens chronicled, or in fact, uh, best of all, Engels in his 1842 book, The Condition of the Working Class of England. So anyone who talks in terms of the historical evolution of the global system ought to also understand the fact that that process of permanent accumulation had been visited upon the working classes of those metropolitan countries already, okay? And therefore, the, the notion that they, they, they are beneficiaries directly of the exploitation of, of, of when that primitive ex, uh, uh, accumulation was pursued on an, on an extended global scale itself begins to fray in, in, in some measure. And I think that we ought to prepare ourselves for understanding the process in a slightly more contradictory way than in the linear sense in which it is being posed that one country and its peoples exploit uh, 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 you know, uh, another country uh, and so on and so forth. In any case, by the time of the, of the period that uh, 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 Davis is talking about, that integration of the global economy as a whole had also meant that, there were th that the rhythms and, 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 uh, of boom and bust were such that they were also beginning to affect 
developments in some of those global south regions were also beginning to affect um, um, you know, the, the fortunes of workers in terms of employment, in terms of wages, and so on. So even around the beginning of the second half of the 19th century, uh, there are those who are beginning to show evidence that uh, uh, events in places like India, such as the Sepoy mutiny or the Taiping rebellion and so on and so forth, contributed to you know, uh, 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 you know, a global recession where workers lost their jobs uh, 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 and so on. So I think that we can, we can talk in terms of the, the, the element of, of, of that, that, uh, you know, that we, we can begin to identify that question of contradiction. And when Mike Davis talks in terms of 1914, what was 1914? 1914 was also the great slaughter where working class people in Europe and so on were mobilized to fight each other for capitalist powers who were, who were wanting to redivide, uh, divide and redivide the world in, in terms of you know, their own imperialist competition. That conscription included bringing in uh, uh, soldiers uh, 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 conscripts from, from those uh, 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 global south uh, countries. It included exploiting uh, new markets. It included ex uh, you know, uh, intensifying the exploitation of existing markets and existing colonies and so on. That intensification included, for example, creating, creating infrastructure, let's say in the case of Africa, from mines to the port to be, to be able to, uh, and roads and so on, to be able to actually you know, uh, 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 you know, extract the wealth and the products of, 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 of the colonized labor more effectively, more ruthlessly and so on. But in the process, working classes began to emerge. So we see not only working classes began to emerge, but other local uh, 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 classes and other local fraction, fractions begin to compete for the surpluses that are being generated through the colonial labor. By the 1920s, for example, we see that the leadership of the Indian National Congress and uh, Indian employers are beginning to find ways in which they can claw back some of the losses that they believe that they have made uh, because of the, the dispossession and, the, and, the, and the, the oppression, the colonial oppression of, of, of the British. You find a similar process underway in Egypt. You find Irish. Uh, um, uh, independence around the same time. You find also, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, the first waves of unionization, mass unionization, in many of these global uh, southern, uh, southern countries. In the, uh, in the Third International, after the, the Bolshevik Revolution, for example, you had delegates who included people from Senegal and, and so on, you know, trade unionists, are beginning to organize on the basis of, of, of the understanding, not simply of the divide between the metropolitan countries and uh, colonized peoples, but on the basis of class uh, uh, and so on. And that same uh, uh, working class that began to emerge in the global south also began to transform the politics and the, and the possibilities of development and growth, the patterns of development and growth, the choices about investment and, and so on in, 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 those, in, in those countries. By the 1930s, unions had become a fact of life in all those countries. Okay, in Africa, for example, which was the last to develop these unions on a, on, on, on a mass scale, you find that by 1938, women in Nigeria can go on a national strike, shut down the entire trading of, uh, 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 system of, of that country. In 1938, oil workers in Trinidad and Tobacco go on strike. In 1938, cocoa farmers across Africa uh, 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 shut down the cocoa trade on, 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 on a global basis. So in 1938, elements of the Labour Party Fabian socialists advised the British colonial government that allowed these people legal trade unions. So in 1938, we do get trade unions across the British Empire, you know, <laughs> sanctioned and legalized under the influence of a particular brand of Labour, uh, 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 Labour Party types, of a particular brand of, uh, of, of, uh, of Labour politician who, as Tony Cliff describes in a, a very important article in 1957, the economic roots of, uh, of, uh, of uh, reformism, who, who actually begin to support or are supporters of an imperial project because actually the growth that is generated from uh, uh, surpluses, from, from the imperial, imperial project, means that there's a possibility that the capitalists who get that, that, those surpluses can invest more into production, to pr w w part of the product which is exported to those countries, but also more into production more generally, that the, the rate, rate at which there can be economic crisis because there's an overgrowth of capital accumulation uh, domestically and so on and so forth can be slowed down and you find that there are those who begin to think that there's an advantage in actually uh, 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 supporting that. But again, Cliff shows that this process is, is contradictory in two ways. Number one, it is not the, redistribu the redistribution or the net transfer of surpluses from the uh, global south to the north was not, um, uh, it did not come directly to the workers. It went to the catalyst. Whether they invested here or not is a secondary matter. And whether they invested or the workers gained uh, a different uh, uh, you know, standard of living because of their own class struggles and the effectiveness of their own class struggles is something that we ought to be also uh, uh, take, take, take into account. <clears throat> 
But the second element is that the process by which the, the colonies become tied to the metropolitan economies can have contradictory effects on the workers themselves. I've already said that as far back as the night, middle of the 19th century, we began to see elements of this. Later on, for example, I mean, in Cliff's article, one of the, 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 the arguments that he makes is that, for example, if you're selling textiles, finished cotton products to India after having destroyed their, their uh, uh, textile industry, and the Indians have to pay by exporting raw cotton to you, okay, that's one thing. It can create jobs in terms of those who are in the, the, the textile industries indirectly because capitalists who, are, who own those industries are investing in it. On the other hand, if you begin to export you know, big capital, for example, locomotives and rail lines and telecommunications and ships and God knows whatever else, there's no immediate means for those colonies to pay. They enter into long-term debt. Because they have to rely on the same export earnings to pay back that debt, the demand on uh, uh, consumption goods from, let's say, Britain begins to fall because they have to save some of, part of that money to begin to pay uh, 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 their, their, their debt, for example. And therefore, the investment that have taken place on the basis of the fact that there will be an expansion of those consumer industries which are supplying the colonies, that investment actually, you know, it, it can become a, a, a problematic. It can, uh, you know, it, it may not have the growth and the profits that it had. Workers begin to get laid off and so on. The idea I'm trying to convey is that not only is, uh, are the, are, are the, uh, um, are the uh, uh, working classes not the direct beneficiaries, but also that in many cases, precisely because cap the, uh, the, the metropolitan capital has extended its clause and gained control of surpluses from elsewhere, that can actually affect the standards of living, negatively impact on the conditions and standards of living of workers in the metropolitan countries themselves. And when we come to today, I think that that's a process that is, is a lot more visible. The period that Tony Cliff was writing, 1957, was a period in which that so-called golden age of capitalism, full employment, uh, God knows what. At the same time, unlike previous periods when, let's say, for example, when Irish uh, 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 farmers were dispossessed or the dispossessed in the English countryside who entered the workforce in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the factories and in the urban areas cheapened the value of labor, at the time, because there was not uh, as much of the migration that we see today, at the time, because the colonial borders were as they, uh, 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 as, as they were, the, those who had been dispossessed in the global south did not enter the British labor force to actually provide a, cheap, a source of cheap labor and to bring everybody's uh, uh, standard of living down. Today, migration plays a completely different role. And I, I think we see the reverberations of that in a number of uh, 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 questions that uh, socialists and uh, people in Britain confront on a contemporary basis. Some of the elements behind the Brexit vote, some of the elements behind the, the rise of racism, the role of migration and so on and so forth. Things which you as us as, as socialists are daily concerned with and, and, and trying to, uh, and trying to um, um, uh, intervene, in, intervene around. But this time the argument isn't. For a lot of British workers, even in terms of their popular consciousness, the common sense of the day, fed from them by the Daily Mail and all the right-wing rags and so on and so forth. The argument isn't that we are gaining from the third world. It is that they, through their cheap labor, are actually beginning to exploit us. Okay? So you can have people like Martin Wolf writing in the Financial Times that, yes, it is true that if British capital goes to the third world, it exploits them, but it's a win-win situation because the third world workers who have been dispossessed of their land also exploit the British companies by gaining employment and higher wages and so on and so forth. And that kind of, uh, it is that same logic that allows a person like Donald Trump to actually talk in terms of the economic nationalism that Chinese workers are, you know, displacing uh, American workers and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that now that we're talking in terms of a global crisis, a global crisis caused by this same overaccumulation on a vast scale with no easy remedy, now that we're talking about the fact that there are not always available uh, new markets to conquer, now that we're talking about the fact that there is actually um, uh, you know, a, 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 a greater correlation in terms of the production relations between people in the third world and, 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 uh, and uh, parts of, the, parts of uh, those who are employed in the third world in the, in the global south, whether in the factories, even those who are employed in, uh, in the informal sector, for example, have uh, you know, some similarity with the so-called precarious workforce, zero hour contracts, so on and so forth, uh, that we see here, those in the retail sector, even those out on the streets selling God knows what, whether it is condoms or chocolates or whatever it is that they're selling on the streets of New Delhi or Mumbai or, or, or in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, outside the favelas in Rio, the fact remains that these are part of a, a network of global supply chains which are dominated by transnational companies, even if they, don't, they are not investing directly in, in, the, in the kind of retail infrastructure which will employ them on a formal basis, give them a constant wage, give them health benefits, give them pensions and so on and so forth. And we find other ways in which the interest of workers in the South and, and, and uh, uh, others in the North are more greatly correlated. 
Okay, so we look at some of the global problems that we face and the class basis of those global problems and the fact that those problems cannot be addressed outside the framework of a consistent, thorough, growing class solution. Climate change, for example. That is something that I think that everybody has a vested interest in actually addressing. Or the wave of privatization that is taking place. So we see that in Hamburg, the G20 uh, uh, is uh, convening there. We know that our comrades demonstrated yesterday. They'll be demonstrating tomorrow as well. One of the topics of the agenda or in, in Hamburg is this so-called new G20 new compact with Africa, which is a bid to ensure that there's a lot more private finance, PFI schemes in infrastructure schemes in Africa. The whole idea, apart from the, 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 the guaranteed high rates of return, is that because of those guarantees and because Africa is risky and because there's so much you know, pent up demand, you know, uh, 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 financial investors who cannot find a ready outlet for making profits here, it's an attractive destination for them. This involves also the privatization and the use of African pensions in the deepening of financial markets in, in, in Africa. It involves privatization. For, for example, in Ghana, for example, the privatization through the PPP, the private public partnership of the electricity company, explicitly, explicitly says that there will be no a, a discontinuation of the free rural electrification project that, that, that is part of, 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 the, the, of the mandate of the existing uh, 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 electricity company. So we're talking about electricity, we're talking about water, we're talking about telecommunications, we're talking about energy, we're talking about transport, transport in all its forms, maritime, air, road, uh, rail, uh, uh, God knows what. And these people are salivating at the fact that overnight, $400 billion worth of African uh, 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 workers' money becomes available for the, for the hedge fund speculators to take. In fact, one British minister, I've forgotten his name, they're usually not worth remembering, but you know, yeah, went to Tanzania and made this glorious, you know, uh, you know described this glorious vision. He says that British workers, he knows that historically British workers are very interested in ensuring that poor Africans who do not have roads do not have railways, do not have water supplies, will get water supplies. So what better arrangement can there be that the non-bank financial institutions take British pension funds, invest it in Tanzania, the Tanzanian gets roads and so on. Of course, toll, you pay a toll for that, using that road, you pay higher water charges and so on and so forth. He, he, was, he was clever enough to omit that from the equation, but basically saying that, you know, British uh, uh, pensioners will gain an income, a steady pe uh, income on their pensions from investing in Africa. Africans will get infrastructure. It's a win-win situation for all. And what we, what we, uh, what, what, you know, and we've say, we, we still see in the same compact the kinds of things that some of you have been worried about in free trade agreements like the TTIP, okay, where you've been concerned about the fact that multinational companies are being given a, a, a extensive powers in the so-called investor state, uh, 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 you know, dispute uh, uh, system. Now, the, 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 the Compact for Africa proposes a, a far more reaching version of that, which includes governments being enjoined to actually act proactively on behalf of an investor. So if, an invest, if the government suspects, the governments have to set up institutions and make sure that they're going around sniffing for a potential complaint by an investor. He hasn't even complained yet by a potential conflict, and they have to correct that complaint. And whether it is about the, the adjustment of currency and ensuring that there are no uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, foreign exchange losses, whether it is about labor conditions and the demand for wages, uh, for higher wages by the, by, the, by the workers employed by all those, you find that there is a stipulation that the government should take proactive measures to actually stem those things. And of course, it is a fact that once the imperial powers are able to gain this new regulatory leeway, these, these advanced rights for businesses, they will seek to globalize that as quickly as possible. In the same way as the new generation of pensions privatization actually becomes a lot more globalized and a lot more multilateralized uh, 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 and, and so on. So it's important in these terms, in, in, in these conditions, to be able to talk point not simply to our, the affinity of interest that we have, but it's also to be able to understand the reality of what, what these developments means for working class life. And you come here to London and you, you hear about Grenfell Towers, we saw Joe Delaney yesterday at the opening rally of, of Marxism, white working class man, young man. There is no way in which you can say that he's a beneficiary of all those migrants from Africa and the global south who share that tower with him. There's no way at all. On the contrary, his strength and their strength depend on working side by side in solidarity with each other, uniting with each other, engaging in common struggle. It's important that at the same time, we find that the, 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 the radicalization that is taking place in Britain finds an expression in condemning the conditions in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that at the same time, condemning the conditions that pertain to the global south. And it's important that someone like Jer Jeremy Corbyn has, has, a, has had a history of, of doing that, not simply in terms of fighting apartheid, when the likes of David Cameron and Margaret Thatcher were calling Mandela a terrorist, 
But more importantly, and more recently, about, for example, the, 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 uh, his response to the Ebola crisis in, in Sierra Leone. When others were using that as a, as, as a means of, of enfor you know, reinforcing racism, uh, 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 Corbyn was saying that the, 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 the impact of poor people in the poorest parts of the world being denied fundamental access to healthcare affects all of us. He, was, he pointed to the solidarity shown by hundreds of NHS workers who went over there. The same NHS, which also employs thousands of people from the global south to ensure that everybody in Britain continues to have universal access to, uh, uh, to health. So there's a conjoint interest, which we have to insist upon, show through the actual reality of, 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 of life that is go going on among the working classes and working people across the world and be able to, uh, uh, as a fundamental structural basis of actually, of actually uh, advancing, uh, 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 advancing our project. The same Corbyn, of course, pointed to the, 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 the danger of uh, British intervention in Libya not simply in Libya itself, but spilling over into places like Mali and, and, and so on. The same crisis that has been generated, which countries like Germany and Holland are taking advantage of to gain a foothold, both militarily within Africa, but also to actually uh, use it to advance the, the, the fortunes of, 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 their, of, their, of their multinationals. The same multinationals who benefit from the common agricultural policy in Europe and so on. The list is endless. So there is no doubt that there's a benefit to imperialism, uh, 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 to, to uh, metropolitan capital in terms of exploiting the, the, the world on, on a global basis. There is very much, however, a doubt to say that that is synonymous with saying that the higher living standards of people in, in, in the West is a direct result of that, or that it is not as a result of the struggles that they themselves have actually waged. And when we're on the cusp of a, a protracted global crisis, when we are, when, when we are in, in the trenches and in, in the midst of, of uh, prolonged austerity, when we are looking at the rise of the right, our ability to be able to resist that on the basis of, so, uh, of an instincting solidarity is important. The likes of Corbyn and so on are important because they, they look to, 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 to an alternative world that is possible. But on top of that, you have to say that the likes of the Socialist Workers' Party is very important because we look day and night to the power of ordinary people and ordinary workers to actually overturn the system. We insist and make no concession on the freedom of movement, or on race, or any of these divisions. We make no, give no quarter on, on the fact that global impoverishment is a result of people whose houses are being dispossessed, or who are being thrown out of their houses because of what happened in Grenfell. So it's important that we build. We work alongside the Corbyns, but we should also build our own forces and make sure that after 100 years after 1917, we can repeat that experience and actually begin to extend it to the rest of the world, including the global south. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, that was a really good speech, Monet, and it's uh, nice to come here and see so many people. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I find funny is when you hear the, the expression, the national interest. It's one of those, I'm just like, what the fuck is the national interest when you hear it? It's like, no, there, there's either a working class interest or there's rich bastards interest. There's no such thing as the national fucking interest. It's, it's just, it's one of those concepts, I just think it's like, shut the fuck up, because like, we know exactly what it means. Wait, it's just rich people, Theresa, you know what I mean? No such thing, is it? Um, but as I say, I mean, I think everyone in this room, we probably do benefit from, say, products in Africa that are exploited. I mean, we probably do in terms of, but that's, it's, I don't think, I mean, it's kind of hard to describe. I mean, I think... We, we do get a lot of resources from Africa, which is through not our fault, but it's through our government's fault. I mean, but as I say, I think it's a global struggle. And it's great that there's trade. I never, I'll be honest, I didn't know there was such a, a big trade union movement in Africa. I didn't know that until um, tonight, which is good. Um, it means it's going on. I knew there was a big movement in Malta. I used to stay in, I studied in Malta University for a year. I know there's quite a big movement there, which is great. Um, I got friends all over the world because... Um, and they said that there's the same as well. So, I mean, I do think that there is a movement. I do think the world is changing. I think people like Jeremy Corbyn um, are doing it. They've shown it in the UK. People like Bernie Sanders in the uh, USA. Uh, Podemos in Spain. Um, Syriza in Greece. It's a pity that fucked up, but there's still potential, I think, uh, if people get angry. Because um, what I think Syriza should have did was when the EU said, no, you're not allowed to do this, I think they should have called for strikes and... Pretty much, the people should have took to the to the streets and put tanks in front of the banks and said, "That's our fucking money. It's our money. Fucking open the banks. It's our money. We don't owe you a fucking thing." That's what they should have did. Um, but I, I just think it's great that there is people such as yourself campaigning. Um, the world it is a racist world we live in. Um, none of us are racist in this room, um, or we wouldn't be here. 
and we've got to change it. So any time someone says something racist in a workplace, we challenge it. We tell them, shut the fuck up, you're wrong. And you tell, give me examples of why black people are, should be exploited. Um, we've got to do that. There's, there's no time for it and we need to stop it. We need to stop it now and sooner the better. Yeah, on the face of it, uh, people saying we benefit from or recognizing that we benefit from the exploitation of people in the developing world or in the global south can appear like a progressive argument. And it is often put forward by people who are genuinely progressive because they want to acknowledge the inequality that exists and they want to, by accepting their responsibility for it, we begin the road to dealing with it. And while that is often done with good intent, I want to say it is an absolutely misguided folly from the point of view of actually helping people who are oppressed in the developing world, or for that matter, uh, in uh, the developed world, or anywhere. Um, and it's particularly striking, I think, for people in Ireland, uh, because it chimes with a concept uh, that we're very familiar with, which is Catholic guilt. Right? So when you were small in Ireland, uh, and you were given something by your parents that you didn't really want to eat, didn't taste very good, they would say, and you said you didn't want it, they'd say, eat it up, think of all the starving children in Africa. <laughs> okay? And now, this is a trivial example, but in fact, uh, it spoke to a much bigger uh, system of inculcating <laughs> guilt uh, in Irish society that led to horrible things in terms of the treatment of women, uh, the oppression of, of the poorest and the most downtrodden, uh, is be, be grateful for what you have because there's always somebody worse off than you. Uh, and you're lucky you're benefiting. Or to put it in simple political terms, eat shit because it could be worse, right? And it's not good to eat shit or to buy into the idea of eating shit because in fact, my place, it, uh, it, it then becomes a reason for you not to fight in your own interests in your own class interests, from the point of view of working people who are oppressed or uh, exploited here because there's somebody worse. So it plays, into this, it plays into the hands of those who want to keep you down and say you have no good reason to fight. Uh, when in fact, when you fight, whether it's in the developing world or anywhere else, it inspires other people. The more you win, the more you uh, raise the bar in terms of what working people are entitled to, uh, what services, what pay, what conditions they're entitled to, whether it's here in uh, the developed world or whether it's in, uh, it's in Africa or wherever it might be, it actually creates an upward trend. So instead of division uh, and competition between people, uh, it's about solidarity and understanding that a victory for, for one is a victory for all. Whether you're in the, whether you're in the developed world or whether you're in uh, the so-called third world. But in fact, we're just in one world. Uh, there's just working people and oppressed people across the world uh, and there's elite uh, in the, uh, across the world. And that... That, that sort of guilt stuff doesn't help us in recognise that basic fact and build a solidarity between all the people who need to stick together uh, to improve their situation. Just while the next um, contributor is um, going to... Just to remind people, feel free to ask questions as well. So that's something I shouldn't, should have said at the beginning. So uh, don't feel the need to just make contributions. Feel free to ask questions as well. There's no such thing as a silly question, certainly in my book. So... Um, I'll then, after uh, the comrade here, I'll bring this comrade here. Yeah, see if you can. Um, I'm just going to apologise if anyone was in the food meet and I'm going to repeat something that I said 
but yeah, I think it is quite important, especially with uh, what the speaker said about the fact that we do need to like mobilize on a global scale. Um, there is actually a huge movement in the global south, the international peasants movement, and um, they go by the name of La Via Campesina. And I've been plugging this all, all through the, the event because I think it's really important to show solidarity as socialists in the global north uh, with those people who campaign for workers' rights, uh, for peasant rights, they, that's how they uh, articulate themselves. Um, <clears throat> basically, their um, self-professed aim is to, in the end, regain control of the means of food production, which is what we're all about as socialists. So um, their name is La Via Campesina. They encompass 73 countries, about 164 separate organisations of fighting against oppression, um, stuff that was mentioned like the fact that massive global uh, transnational companies have this monopoly on seeds and land and stuff. So yeah, um, you can go online and you can support them just by signing petitions and sharing it, sharing that information with people you know. So La Via Campesina, thank you. <laughs> Make your way to the front. Um, I'm going to start with a shameless plug for my own meeting tomorrow, <laughs> which is about the um, the, comp, uh, the Russian Revolution and the colonial world. We'll be talking about some of the stuff that Manny mentioned about the Comintern and what's uh, going to be uh, what that's about. But one of the things I wanted to uh, to talk about uh, today was common sense and this idea, which. It does seem obvious that if you are, are living in the West and we have more things and we get fruit, for instance, that's brought in from poorer countries, then we are benefiting from it. And I think, uh, in a way, it is this whole thing of trying to undermine what seems like the common sense, which I think what Manny's done and earlier speakers have done is saying about why there is actually a degree of solidarity, or should be, between uh, people working in, uh, in places like Britain and, uh, and in poorer countries. And I think actually it's something that in some ways has become easier with things like the whole issues around Grenfell and stuff to, to explain, uh, because we're not just talking about people here. Uh, if you say we all benefit, it does kind of make it seem like there's no big distinction between um, us and the Queen or whoever the rich people are who are about. But also, it has a, an implication for people in poorer countries, in as much as saying that you almost have a, a shared interest, that you are all being exploited um, by the people in the West. And one of the things that Manny talked about how um, in a lot of the, the poorer countries, uh, living standards have gone down and people have got a lot poorer. Um, well, it's uh, always worth saying that not everyone's got poorer. In lots of uh, these countries, there's whole sections of society, a small uh, middle upper class who've got an awful lot richer and are now leading um, living standards which are the same as those, uh, those in the West. And you can find that uh, sort of Western style malls in the centre of capitals all over the poorest countries of the world. And I think that um, saying people shouldn't be identifying with the people living in those, they should be identifying with, uh, with poorer people who are having to struggle. Because I think in the end, there's a, the prob one of the problems is saying it sort of creates a binary. You're either in the rich country there or you're the poor country there, and that means you're either rich or poor. But what happens about how all these people in different countries in interrelate? Are people, if you're saying that people in Britain are exploiting people in Mali, that might seem um, obvious. What about are people in China exploiting people in Mali? Are people in South Africa exploiting people in Mali? You have this sort of thing. Is it just because one person's richer than another that that means they're exploiting the other person? Comment. And I think that that once you start thinking about it in those terms, it starts undermining the argument that it's a, a sort of a moral thing that if I've got enough food, then I'm exploiting the person who hasn't. And actually, um, the reason that people in Britain have enough food is to say it's not because the ruling class here wanted to give it to us, it's because people fought for it. After the next uh, contributor, if I could take the comrade at the back and make the way to the front, please. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. Um, one question is, where can I get absolutely clear, incontrovertible evidence to show what you told us about the immiseration of so, the mass of people in the world and the growing poverty. I ask this question because I am constantly stunned when I go to upper middle class areas to meet international lawyers, international financiers, people who jet off to Bangalore and people who travel around and who tell me 
There's a growing middle class around the world. Capitalism is working. They're doing a version of trickle-down, but they are absolutely insistent that things have got better. Mm -hmm. Now, 50 years ago, I lived in Mali, and I saw children dying of measles, and I saw rich bastards in the Malian ruling class. Nowadays, I visit Glasgow. I walk through West Glasgow and see immense wealth built during the empire. In 1904, Western Glasgow was more of a boom town than, than Dubai is now. It was, it's stunning. And people are living in those mansions now in a city where the life expectancy in the west of Glasgow is something like 30 years lower than the life expectancy in the east of Glasgow. So that is one illustration. Grenfell Tower's another. They're all over the place. I've seen it in my own town where there are so many wealthy pensioners and they are desperate to have really low-paid workers caring for them in their old age, cleaning their houses and so on. It's there. It's staring us in the face. And yet it is constantly denied by the international lawyers and the educated people who are quite serene about the situation of the world. Give me just one place where I can point those people and say, look, you can't see it in front of your nose in Glasgow. You can't see it in front of your nose in Mopti. But here is the evidence. And don't give me Donald Trump's Move after the next speaker, um, the gentleman at the back with the green T-shirt. If they can make his way to front, thank you. See, if this meeting had been called, do British capitalists uh, benefit from oppression in the global south? The answer would be very simple. Of course they do. Capitalists will exploit people and oppress people wherever they can if there's a buck in it for them. We know that. Um, it's also true that if you look at the global south itself, they're joined in that process of exploitation by, the, by contingents of super rich people in the global south itself in many countries. If you look at China today, China has more billionaires than America has. There is an element in the global south that join in the spoils of exploitation along with Western and British multinationals. For British workers to benefit from exploitation in the global south, there'd have to be some mechanism for transferring wealth from the ruling class here that comes from the pillage of the global south into the pockets of working class people. And nobody has ever been able to discover any mechanism by which this happens in reality. And instead, you face a situation where both in the global south and in countries like Britain, there's a process of exploitation between those at the top and those at the bottom. And we have to therefore start from a very simple fact that the relationship of exploitation that we talk about is a relationship between classes, not a relationship between nations. I agree very much with the first comrade who spoke, who said, actually, there's no such thing as a national interest. There are class interests that play out in a national terrain. That's true in Britain as much as it's true in the, glo in, in the global south. Now, that faces, though, a problem because we have to be able to explain to people the enormous disparities in wealth between countries like Britain and countries in the global south. And here I think we have to talk about two things. First of all, we have to talk about the process of imperialism and underdevelopment imposed on continents such as Africa in the past, uh, in the colonial period, in the sla slave trading period, uh, and going on into the, in into the current period, in which vast amounts of wealth was plundered from these societies. We also have to say, though, that that capitalist wealth and investment will tend to be channeled and is still today channeled at those places where investment historically has taken place because these are the places where it's most profitable to invest. The bulk of the money from the multinationals comes from America, Europe, and the developed core of the capitalist system. Uh, because they can grab more wealth there, that's why they pump money into, in, 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 into, the, into, these, into these economies. The final point I, I want to make, though, is that when we talk about the Global South, we have to understand the Global South has changed. There isn't one place in the globe that is called the Global South that is completely uniform. A whole number of countries have been able to break through into the world system. You think about South Korea, a very poor country 40 or 50 years ago, or you think about what's happening to China today. Uh, the Global South is changing, it's diverse, and it, and it contains unevenness within itself. Um, the person who mentioned uh, Chinese imperialism was right. China goes in and invests huge amounts of money uh, obtaining mineral wealth for, from sub-Saharan Africa. What's the relationship between China 
and sub-Saharan Africa. It's one of imperialism. If you could sum up. It was a whole hi- hierarchy of, of nation states uh, as part of this imperialist system. It's a complicated picture. Final point, I'll, I'll finish on this. In one sense, capitalism enormously simplifies our job. There are now 1.6 billion wage workers on a global scale. And as Manny told us, there are eight people control as much wealth as half the world's population. Fantastic. The task of socialists is to mo- mobilize those 1.6 billion people, grab the wealth of those eight people, and start to uh, mobilize it in a democratic and sustainable way. Yeah, if the gentleman in the green T-shirt and then the gentleman in the half shirt, if you want to make your way up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you don't want the camera. Okay. Could take the camera off, please. Thank you. Um, quickly, a uh, guy talking about Irish anecdotes. In Ireland, many years ago, uh, the nuns would come rattling around the tins for money and saying, uh, we're coming to collect for the black babies. Now, it sort of fed into a notion that Africans were this uh, bunch of people that had to be saved, a little Victorian notion of that, that they couldn't really help themselves, you know? And I think as socialists, we've got to question the notion of charity. I mean, I donate to charity when there's a disaster and a lot of other people do, because you see people suffering and dying. But we've got to question the notion of charity that it can actually do anything to change um, society at all in those countries. That's all. And then, yeah, if you want to make your way up. Um, I want to give an example of how um, global struggles, north and south, came together very concretely. A um, hundred years ago, this year, two million people were gathered together in what was a metropolis of war in northern France and the border of Belgium. Uh, that was a working class mobilised by the British to fight an imperial war. Uh, it included Egyptian labourers, Chinese labourers, and an industrial working class recruited for the first time, really, on mass level from, from Britain. Uh, and they suffered from very similar conditions, very similar oppression. Uh, you can, well, you can, imagine, you can imagine the rest. But they didn't just suffer. On the 5th of September, uh, 1917, uh, Chinese and Egyptian labourers, first at the port of Boulogne and then at the point of Calais, went on strike. General Haig sent the troops in with orders to shoot. 27 labourers were shot dead. But interestingly, according to one account at least, the troops that were sent in to shoot the Egyptian and Chinese labourers also turned their guns on the officers in a nearby cafe and shot them as well. But it doesn't solidarity, it didn't just end there. On the 9th of September, just five days later, the biggest mutiny in British history to that, to that date in the First World War started in Etapla, when at least 10,000 soldiers, Scots, Irish, New Zealanders and Australians, rampaged through their camp against the brutal, brutality which they were suffering for five days. As a result of that, the commander in charge of the camp was sacked, the training regime was scrapped, and the entire British army, very shortly after, got a pay rise. That was a coming together of struggles north and south. Um, could the person, yeah, if you want to make your way to the front. Um, thank you, Manny, for such a good talk. I mean, you started off by saying what a large increase in the gap in earnings between uh, people in the, in the industrial north and the global south uh, and, and how that gap had widened over, over, over the last um, decades or even hundred years. And actually that's a process that's also occurred uh, within the UK. When, when I started off as a junior doctor working in the hospital, there, there was a certain gap between you know, the top doctor in a hospital uh, and the cleaner. Uh, and I'm just reflecting on what that is now. We've got at Bart's, you know, people who come from uh, Bart's Hospital where, where in the area I work, where, where cleaners are on strike at the moment, we heard at the opening rally, and they're on strike for, um, you know, just to get a little bit more than the uh, minimum wage. Now I'm looking at the, the pay now that the chief finance officer at Bart's Health earns, you know, 280,000 uh, pounds a year, 
plus his living expenses, his rent was paid, uh, uh, of another £58,700 accommodation costs in less than two years. So these sorts of inequalities have been building up all across the world. And actually, you know, those are managers who are directly employed by the NHS. And the real con is when those people leave and then they move in, uh, move sideways and start walking, working for PricewaterhouseCooper. And then they get re-employed back into the NHS on 500 to 1,000 pounds a day consultancy. That's 1,000 pounds a day consultancy. So you can see these wage gaps the, the, between the, the rich and the poor building up in this country as well as between the global south and the north. And I think that those sorts of things make one realize that this is a feature of the development of capitalism globally and not, uh, you know, some uh, so, something about colonialism and imperialism. It is about colonialism, imperialism, but not in the way that I was taught it when I was a child. When I was taught about colonialism when I was a child, I was taught, oh, it was rich countries exploiting the poor. But now, you know, we, we, we've got a better understanding, at least I've got a better understanding of imperialism, as the clash between different imperial powers in the way that they want to carve up the world economy, which Manny laid out in his introduction to the t talk. So thank you very much. After the next speaker, a uh, gentleman at the front. Uh, do rich countries exploit poor countries? You know, I think to a certain degree it does come across as a commonsensical you know, argument, but it doesn't stand up to history. Because if you look at the tail end of the 19th century, when millions and millions of pounds from colonial exploitation were flooding into this country, remember the match girls of Bryant and May you know, went on strike for a living wage. If you look at the 1930s, you know, and the Jarrow hunger marchers and you consider your you, you you need to consider the fact that look you know uh, if they were benefiting from the exploitation of colonial workers then they wouldn't have had to walk the length and breadth of this country to come and beg the authorities in london you know for work if you're like me and you grew up in england in the 1960s we used to go and visit our friends, you know, in council houses, because to be honest with you, that was the only place where you could keep warm. Because in my house, you know, the toilet used to be at the back, uh, which was general for, you know, most people. And at night, you know, if you wanted to do the business, you know, then you had to do it in a chamber pot. And I remember as a child, it was my job to empty, you know, the chamber pot. I mean, coupled with the fact that when you look at this country, today and you consider the fact that over about 20 years living standards have fallen wages have fallen people are actually living you know on credit you know and i remember many times many many uh many uh during the 1917 revolution when lenin said you know, uh, one of the things that he recognized that workers wouldn't take any nonsense anymore was when a worker said, they dare not give us bad bread anymore, you know. And I had that kind of uh, revelation when I spoke to my uh, news agent uh, a couple of weeks ago when he said that, look, if you've got a situation where people are using credit cards to buy newspapers, to buy sweets, to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, top up their oyster cards and so on and so forth. That isn't a sign of benefit. It's a sign of a crisis, you know, a crisis, you know, uh, you know, uh, a crisis generating, you know. And when we look at the situation where the Tories are actually denying public sector workers, you know, a 1% pay increase and when you also look at the situation whereby what they did to us in terms of privatization in, and in terms of neoliberalization and if you consider the fact you know that the former president of Nigeria's best capitalist was Richard Branson you know Richard Branson that benefits from privatization in this country the same Richard Branson that they wanted to hand over Nigerian railways to run I think that goes to show that we have common interest we have a common fight and we have a common interest in transforming this society and and in making it one where 
the resources that are needed for proper development are granted to us. But we won't get those resources unless we decide you know, to build across boundaries, to build an international movement, to take the resources from the capitalists and ensure that working people have uh, a world that is fit to live in. Thank you. Just before the next speaker, just there is there is still some time for questions or contributions. So, so feel free to put your hand up if you if you want to do so. Yeah, I just want to come back to the point that was made about um, imperialism, because certainly my experience of the time I had in Ghana was the Chinese imperialism. If you take the road from Accra to Kumasi, that is run by Chinese companies with horrible exploitation of Chinese technicians as well as workers from, from Ghana. Uh, the second point I want to make is that of the class nature of, uh, of, of Ghana and, and other African uh, countries. Uh, certainly in, in Ghana, now in places like Accra and Kumasi, you're seeing gated uh, communities, extreme wealth, um, many Ghanaians driving around in very expensive cars, exactly identical to the situation you have in this country. Mm. And, it, it, you know, you, one has to understand if you have that class nature in Ghana, there is going to be struggle. And that is the great thing that we need to emphasize. There is a whole history of magnificent struggle against colonialism in those countries, against slavery in those, in those countries. And that struggle goes on today. Certainly in teachers, teachers in Ghana are forever, they're organized, they take strike action, and they pull other workers with them. Secondly, in Kenya, over the last two or three months, doctors have been on strike over a long period of time because the agreement that they had with the Kenya government was reneged on by the government in Kenya. We do need to understand there is struggle, the class nature, and that struggle unites us in this country and with what's happening across the world. There is still some time for contributions and questions, so does anybody want to? Yeah, do you want to come back? Oh, do you want to come to the front then? Yeah, cheers. Yeah. It's, it's more a question that I would like to know if you know more about it than me. Um, now, the, you. yeah, you than me. Than, well, <laughs> yeah. <not>. Now, <laughs> th there's a really good film. It's called The Constant Gardener. Now, I, I, now the events in the film are meant to be fictional, but I've heard from a few people that apparently things like that happen in real life. Now, do you know the film? Yeah. You know the film, yeah. Okay. It's basically um, pharmaceutical companies. Um, try new drugs, they don't know if they work yet, to try and inject people in Africa, right? And basically, a lot of the times, it fucked people up and killed them. But it was like they were, Africans were being tested on because no one gave a fuck about them. And it was big British and US companies that were doing it to make a profit. Now, I've heard it's true, I've heard it does happen in real life, but I don't know if it's definitely true, and I was wondering if you knew more about it than me, and I think it's still relevant to this debate because it is... It is about class, it's about race, it's about basically rich companies taking the absolute piss out of poor people and exploitation. So I'd, I'd like to know more about it. There's still time for a couple of contributions. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, yeah. if you want to come to the front. What your talk didn't tackle is the relationship between between the bourgeoisie in the imperialist countries in Britain and America and, and the working class. And if you go into the history, there's a very close relationship between large sections of that working class with the British and American bourgeoisie and French bourgeoisie in the major imperialist countries because there is an exploitative process that goes on. You do benefit. People benefit from house prices. I know people who've benefited over the last 40 years from house 
rising house prices. Now, if you're an, uh, an exploited country, you don't benefit from those things. But in Britain, I can give you concrete examples of working-class people who have benefited from uh, the, the, the rising of house prices and things like that. And um, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Um, Richard, you said that you think that we don't benefit, but I just wonder if perhaps we do. Uh, the, the example I, would, I was thinking of was, I understand that, that minerals, etc., are used in phones. And if we're making phones over here, we're actually getting manufacturing. You actually get quite a good wage. You know, it's above the minimum wage. Um, and that's good for us here. But if you go to where the minerals are coming from, if the company, if they're, people are getting exploited, if there's no workers' rights, you know, if it's children that are being used to get them, and then the big companies are, I've got a kind of middleman that comes along, buys them off them for pennies, then we get a better wage because of that. So surely we do benefit from the oppression of people in countries that don't have as much workers' rights as we do here. Surely we, we do benefit from that. That's just a question. It's time for one more contribution from the floor. So if anybody who hasn't spoken previously... Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. And you'll be the last speaker. It's just a small question. My question is... Um, to what extent do you think a disruption to the establishment would be effective enough by the united working class to bring about change? Okay, I can take one more contribution, uh, given that was... Uh, um, so did anyone speak? Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. <clears throat> well, I, I could ask you... If you think that the, the South, the, what you might call the Third World, would actually be any worse off if the International Monetary Fund, Anstroke, or the World Trade Organization was actually abolished. I know the, you know, the poorer <laughs> countries don't have the same yeah. representation yeah. with the WTO anyway. And I think one way which we've all got power is with our buying power and deciding where to shop and what to buy or not to buy when we get in there. You know, whether we're going to buy organic and fair trade and thinking of the people that perhaps haven't had the proper protection when they've sprayed the bananas with pesticides. And in terms of, you know, things like that should be made illegal, the, the way that people are buying and selling crops before the crops are even grown, like a futures market on food. And... I mean, personally, I've boycotted Nestles for years because of the way that they've pushed the baby milk in the third world. So people, instead of giving breast milk, they've used dirty water to make the baby milk, which has resulted in so many babies dying. And particularly when you look at the corrupt organisations like Monsanto, that I think, you know, and hybrid seeds and the amount of suicides in India alone that they're responsible for, because people can't save the seeds from one year to the next. Thank you. I'll, I'll bring the speaker back in now to sum up for about 10 minutes or so. so thank you. Uh, thank you, comrades, for uh, very important uh, uh, contributions, especially those that, uh, if you like, corrected the, the kind of uh, um, bending the stick emphasis that I, that I wanted to give to a number of things, including, for example, this notion of immiseration. I think it's important what others have said. Not, not simply because, and in any case, the figures that I, I was giving were averages, national averages, okay? And do not apply to different levels of even working, among the working people themselves. So one example. If you take someone who has just moved from the countryside to get a job in a factory, for a multinational, or even for a local manufacturer, obviously they get more money. So the Financial Times carried a very important article about Ethiopia, about, I think sometime last week. And one of the things that it describes Mobilizing, mobilizing the argument to imply that capitalism works for everybody is to describe the 
a, a young woman who, who leaves a, a village, goes to a, 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 the, the nearby metropolitan center, gets a job, and, and her wages are about five times what they were some time ago. Now, in that sense, she has a higher standard of living than those she had left behind in the rural area. Does that mean she's exploiting them? Or if she went through, past that, that metropolitan center and came to England and, and worked for a wage here, is she suddenly now the same person remitting income to her family? Is she suddenly now somebody who's exploiting them back home or what? I mean, that's the essential point that, that I wanted to stress. The reason why I talked in terms of that immigration is simply because, yes, capitalism is not work, working for a majority of people. But those who are talking in terms of the fact that there is enormous wealth in areas of the global south, absolutely true. Absolutely true. I mean, the stunning thing, you could be in India, open a newspaper, and people talk in terms of the amount of you know, gold that some rich person wants to do something with, whether I give for a bride or do whatever it is, well, you know, and refuse to pay tax, and you know, the, 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 the same mechanisms, tax haven, tax dodging, whatever, the, all the ruling classes of the world are un united in, 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 those, uh, in, in those things. So that, the, the, the emphasis that I wanted to give is, is, is what, what I've, I've tried to explain. People have said it in different ways, suicides of farmers in India and so on and so forth. Those things are taking place side by side with the immense wealth that others are accumulating in India and beyond its borders, in Africa, beyond its borders, and, 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 and so on. And I think, again, that those who talked in, in terms of the, the, the fact that the, the relationships between the global economy and parts of the global south have continued to change, as indeed there have been changes within the global south itself. Okay? So that, the, 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 for example, up, up until the 1970s, from the point of view of European uh, 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 transnational companies, especially French transnational companies, up to about 25% of their outward foreign investment went to Africa. Today, it's around 2%, okay? They're struggling to ratchet it up in competition with the Chinese and so on, but it has fallen drastically. The share of African trade in, uh, 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 as, as, a, as, a, as a ratio of European trade in 1970-71 would have been around 18%. Today, it's 1%. So, and it confirms the point that uh, 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 Joe, uh, Joseph Chinano was making about the fact that there has been a restructuring of, in, uh, of investment back to the centers of metropolitan capital itself. And this was a process that actually started before even these years that I'm talking about. Part of the reason why it was, it was uh, after, the, after Indian, in, uh, the independence of the Indian subcontinent in 1947, it became increasingly more viable for uh, uh, col uh, uh, European col colonists to withdraw from Africa while seeking to retain control of those economies. What's precisely because the, the economies, the colonies were not delivering the surpluses that they used to deliver, okay? And that reintegrating into the global system, especially with the support of the United States Marshall Plan and so on to rebuild Europe, both as, a, as an ally, but also as, as, a, as a market and as a place for, for, for investment, was part of that reorientation away from that. So even the naked facts in terms of those who point to the exploitation taking place in the global south and the benefits that derive from there, even at the macro level in terms of accruing it themselves, I think, that, uh, I think that we have to qualify that very heavily. And I think that it's important that Joe, Joe brought that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, um, uh, that, that, that corrective to that point. It's also true that the inequality is rising in the global south itself. In fact, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, it's true that there are more billionaires in, Ch in China than the United States. But in terms of trend, for the years, this is the years in which commodity, the commodity price boom in Africa in the 21st century have collapsed since 2014. There are countries where national income has fallen by 50% in two years. Yet in that same continent, you find that according to the, the, to, to the Bank of International Settlements and the IMF, there is the highest growth the, the, in terms of rate of growth from a low base, of course, of what they call high net worth individuals than anywhere else in the world. In other words, there are more millionaires being created in terms of rate of being created in Africa than anywhere else in the world. That's the truth of the fact. They may not be the richest people in the world, but, but these are the realities that actually, that, 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 uh, 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 actually exist. So the question of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of inequality, the question that it is rooted in uh, exploitation, the question that if there's cheap labor in Africa, it's not simply imperialists and transnational companies who exploit it, but the local ruling classes are very happy to actually do so. And in fact, they deliver that cheap labor as an offer, as in terms of the competitive advantages of actually uh, uh, partnerships with, 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 with foreign capital and so on. And Chinese do it. And when living standards rise in China, you find that manufacturing, part of the manufacturing in China and India begins to relocate to East Africa and elsewhere. Okay, so you, that, 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 that exploitation of, of, of cheap labor is a feature of, of, of capitalism itself. In the same way, we also have to say that investments from Africa 
out of the country and also increasing. It's, you know, if you look at the statistics, usually people refer to simply illicit financial flows as if the, the, the main mechanism of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, capitalism in Africa is corruption, illegality, theft, and so on and so forth. No, actually, it is still very much the expanded reproduction on the basis of exploiting more and more out of, uh, out, out, out of, out of workers. And African capitalists actually invest abroad heavily. I mean, you take London as a whole. I mean, to be honest, if the Nigerian ruling class withdrew his money from the London banking system, it would collapse overnight. That's the fact. Okay? So at the same time that we have Grenfell Towers, we know that those estates around it include, if you read the Panama Papers and all the tax havens, we know that the housing market in London and elsewhere has been inflated by the ruling classes of the world, including from the global south, buying our properties as their holiday homes and so on. We know that at the same time that workers are starving or being ejected from their jobs in Nigeria, a Nigerian hedge fund buys Gatwick Airport. We know that. Those are the facts of the matter that actually exist. So I think that our understanding of class as a central feature of this process that comments have insisted upon is absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely important. That understanding of class includes, as Roger said, class struggles. And the two things that I, I, I want to point to in terms of the differences between, because Richard was, was right about the fact that struggles here inspire struggles every, everywhere else. In fact, sometimes in ways in which, you know, are quite, you, you can't easily account for. So I remember that when the poll tax uh, uh, riots took place here in Britain, I think what was 1991? Thereabouts, there were banners on strikes in the whole of Southern Africa, Zambia and Co, holding banners which said "No poll tax, no poll tax." Meanwhile, no one was proposing to to introduce a poll tax in, in Zambia. The very idea that you know you could have such a mass revolt against the state, against the government, and bring down a prime minister fit with the mood in Zambia. And in fact, in that year, the president of Zambia, his government was toppled by mass out, 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 uprisings, mass uprisings which led to the formation of a party based on trade unions, but unfortunately it was the trade unions of, 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 you know, led by the bureaucracy, the kind of Fabian socialists whose legacy, as I said, started in 1938 in Africa. They are those who actually led that, that uh, movement down, 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 down a cool, cool de sac. We saw it in a number of diff diff different places. But those struggles actually um, um, uh, uh, continue to take place. Some of the drawbacks of, 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 of viewing uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the character of, of global capitalism and disparities and, and unevenness through the lens of regions and na nations and so on and so forth is that it actually reinforces some of the common sense that actually demobilizes people. So nationalism is one, 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 one area. It is not simply the racists who will say migrant labor uh, impoverishing in Africa. You will find people who say Western influence in general is bad. White people are bad. The, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, and it seems to fit, okay? You find that kind of thing that's actually demobilizing people. And it is a short step from that to actually having an identity politics which is negative about other people from other countries, other people from different ethnic groups, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's one dimension. But on the, on, uh, even for radical socialists and radical nationalists, there's another dimension, which is that those are people who look essentially to the state to be the key mechanism for change to be the key defense mechanism against imperialism, to be the key regulator of, capi of capitalism, unlike the, 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 the question that the sister asked, uh, the, the, uh, the, the young comrade asked at the, at, the, at the end of it, that they do not look to a global coordinated, uh, a, a global uprising of, of, of workers to actually change the system, to bring about intense change. They look towards the state. And actually, part of the history seems to fit with that. In the 1960s, when Investment was, was, was being uh, reoriented in the West. In the period of that golden age of capitalism, in the same period also, actually, you also had a, a massive rise in economic growth in Africa itself. Not simply because of the global growth as a whole, that was part of it, but also because newly uh, independent countries had won the, 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 the state machinery and were using that to begin to make changes in terms of the way in which the, 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 the colonial order, the legacy of the, of the colonial order. More diversification in the economies, in the industri attempts at industrialization, and showing that poor farmers had, thank you, poor farmers had um, 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 you know, uh, 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 guaranteed incomes and so on, uh, uh, life expectancy uh, increasing, child mortality reducing, massive growth in health and education and so on. So, so there are people who have a memory of saying that the state or some variant of state capitalism works. And I think that today, precisely because of what we're talking about in terms of globalization, in terms of you know, uh, so on, so, that option is actually a, 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 a lot more constrained. And therefore, the, 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 the fact that those things are a substitute or another path towards a cl class struggle, I think that is a profoundly mistaken uh, view today. In those days when people in the West uh, uh, militants and, and trade union activists, labor, labor activists, socialists, and so on, who, they did not simply see their own struggles as inspiring those of the global south. They also looked to examples of the global south. But they looked to examples which actually were those of, of, of those state capitalists themselves. The Vietnamese, 
the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. More, later on, after that, they began to look at the struggles of workers themselves, so workers in South Africa, workers in South Korea, workers in Brazil in the early 1980s, and, and so on. And I think that that mutual process of learning from each other, learning from our struggles in the same way that Irish water campaigners can look to what happened in Bolivia in the 21st century is an important, uh, is important evidence of the kind of you know, uh, uh, mutual reinforcement that we can, we, we, we can look to. And I think it begins to answer the question that the comrade asked at, at the end. Because of the, the structural location of working people as those who are the source and lifeblood of profits, yes, their intervention can actually interrupt the way in which capitalists extract that, that profit, the way in which capitalists bolster both, both their power as a result of, of the uh, monopoly of, the, of, of, those, of, 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 of that process, monopoly and ownership and control of that process. But it is also true that the, the process of production itself and the process of struggle actually involves people uh, uh, working in concert with one another, whether it's on a factory floor, whether it's across a, a community in terms of, what, like we see, we're seeing in, in Grenfell and so on, or whether it's an international struggle such as anti-apartheid uh, and so on. And those mechanisms, that way in which politics is integrated with economic struggles, political struggles, with, with, with uh, economic struggles, and an, an unremitting fight for, for, for uh, uh, equality and, uh, and a progressive social, social agenda, those are the elements which actually begin to transform the way in which we see each other, transform our own power and, and bring closer the possibility of actually bringing about the change that, 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 that we're talking about. Is that possible? Yes, it was possible. It was possible 100 years ago with a much more fragmented global working class, a much more disconnected one. Today, I may not be, I mean, it's very difficult for me to pass myself off as a starving baby from Africa, but... <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, I think that the, 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 the points that people have made in terms of the kinds of struggle that we, 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 we can engage with apply to me as well as it applies to any starving baby anywhere else, applies to you in this room as well. Because the unity of interest that people are pointed to here is real. The necessity, above all that unity, the necessity of coming together to fight global challenges is real, is, 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 a, is a here and now thing. And the, and the struggles that you engage with today the struggles that you, you, uh, allow you to take forward the radicalization taking place in, in Britain today will continue to inspire other people in Britain, including migrants, in the same way as you'll be open to examples that, that inspire you and models of organizing and, and, and social movements, models of organizing socialist organizations that actually uh, will, take, will take place elsewhere in, the, elsewhere in the world. That struggle will continue. The point is that incrementally we have to find ways to win. And ways to win require us to get rid of arguments such as the, the, this misleading one about the gain that, that uh, 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 British workers and workers in the West uh, uh, make from the Africa, make, make from uh, uh, Africa, Asia, and so on and so forth. Rather, we should point to the rising numbers of working people in those countries, in the huge urban formations, in, in countries like India, where the world's biggest general strike took place, I think, about 18 months ago, and, and, and so on and so forth. The political consequences and possibilities that can arise from that is what we, we ought to look to, not the bullshit about starving babies who don't look like me. Thank you.